Welcome back to another edition of the podcast. I'm your host, Michael Pagani, joined alongside Dave Nailgun Nailer, who is a CFL insider. Welcome to the podcast, Dave Nailer. Thank you again for coming on. My pleasure. Good to be here. So getting into the interview here, you know, like how has the pandemic really affected your mental health? Well, it's it's funny. Um, one of the things I always like about my job is that it's different every day. Um, and that part of it remotely has stayed the, the same. The difference is that, you know, the interaction that I get with people, whether it's at work, a, a lot of times I think the creative process comes from just spitballing with people at your desk, at the water cooler, standing at the doorway of someone's office, coming up with ideas. So I think those things have, have kind of been lost. One of the reasons that I got into sports journalism, even at the very beginning, was, I, I, you know, I love to travel. I don't want to be one of these guys who's on the road 200 days a year. But, you know, 10 trips a year is kind of about what I like to do. It, I like the, the, the kind of feeling of being in a new city or, you know, something like that. Uh, I haven't been anywhere since the NFL Combine in Indianapolis in February 2020. So that part has definitely been affected. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's put more of a premium on just kind of developing ideas off of things, you know, which is I think we're in a world where we kind of are more driven by idea journalism than we are by necessarily just covering what's happening. But I think throughout, especially while the CFL wasn't playing and, you know, we're following, you know, Canadian college players or Canadians in the NFL, it really put more of a premium on, you know, how do we, what, what ideas can we come up with, you know, and how can we be more creative than, than maybe we've had to be in the past because of all of that. So I actually don't feel like I've been, you know, at a loss of things to do since the big pandemic began. I mean, people may be surprised to hear me say that given, you know, the, the, the year off, let me just let a dog outside. One yeah, second. sure. Go ahead. The, um, yeah, maybe people surprised to hear that, but I, I, I think it was, it was a different pace of work. Like I wasn't working to a daily deadline or waiting for breaking news as often. It was more project oriented stuff, but you know, I got some opportunities to do some things that normally I don't have the time to do. You know, I wrote, you know, five to 6,000 words on a Joe, a Joe, you know, the receiver at Clemson from Brooks, Alberta, who has one of the most fascinating stories um, I've ever, I've ever come across and, and we'll do it in television at some point. Um, but last year there was no option to do it in television. And I normally don't have the time in my work world to invest, to write a long form, you know, 5,500 word story about a player. And I got to do those kinds of things. So there are, it did create opportunities as well. How heartbreaking was it for you to be informed by, you know, the decision of the government when they wouldn't get spending or they wouldn't, you know, the CFO wouldn't receive extra spending for their league? It wasn't really heartbreaking to me at all. And to be honest, it's, it's a decision that I kind of supported. Um, you know, are we, are we, are you, your screen is frozen. Is mine? Oh, are you all right? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Good. Okay. You're frozen for me, but as long as I'm good. No, it was a decision I supported. You know, I don't necessarily believe that, the government's role is to to subsidize professional sports, you know, even in a pandemic. And I know there are all kinds of comparisons we could make. You know, the National Arts Center got a big handout. And how is that different than the Canadian Football League? But I, I've always believed that professional sports is a bit of a luxury in society. And even though it creates employment and, and stimulates some business, although it's not as much as people like to say, uh, I think it's it's not a necessity in society. You know, it's it's I love it. It's been my career work, but it's a distraction. You know, that's that's what it really is. It's entertainment, and I don't I don't necessarily have a problem with it not being on the government's list of priorities. And and I also thought that, you know, the CFL is a league with a lot fewer resources than say you know the NFL or certainly the upper also the upper levels of of NCAA college football. And I thought, you know, why not let them go first? Let, let the NFL and college football try this with their immense amounts of money that they can throw at these problems. And let's go to school on that. So I was, I was actually one of the people who, you know, probably few people in the media that thought they shouldn't play last year. Um, and, and I, I know, and one of the reasons it was, was given by, for people why they should play is, Oh my God, if they don't play for a year, what's going to happen to the Canadian football league? Well, last I checked our ratings are up 11%. You know, and I know attendance yeah. is down in some places, but it's, it's really hard to use attendance as a gauge right now because there's so many reasons why people might not go to a game, uh, plus the restricted crowds in other places. But if you look at television audiences, which, you know, there's no obstacles to that, uh, the, the audiences are up. So I, I never believed in the, you know, out of sight, out of mind theory. So I didn't feel there was that pressure to play for the league last year. I thought, you know what, stand down, go to school on the other leagues and come back in the, in the summer of 2021 
you know, with, you know, the, the margin for error in the Canadian Football League is, is thinner. I, I thought if they tried to do it last fall without vaccinations, that there was a pretty good chance they might not get through a season. And I thought that would be worse than not playing at all. A really good follow on Twitter that I've been keeping up to date with, like the audience that you mentioned is Adam Seaborn. He's a great mm-hmm. follow for Twitter. He's been basically tweeting out all the uh, audience like statistics mm-hmm. on the CFL this season. And personally, like, I, you know, me with my tie cats out on, uh, I love the CFL and it's great to see them back playing. And I think one of the reasons why we are seeing such a rise in audience viewership is because of the return to the season. Yeah, I mean, the only other experiment really we had in our lives to see what would be comparable was was 0405 when the NHL didn't play. And there were a lot of people at that time that were screaming, oh, my God, they're not playing. You know, you can't just go back. You know, it's it's out of sight, out of mind. And I was probably one of them (laughs) who was saying that, you know, was saying, you know, there's you can't just disappear for a year from your product. Well, I was also covering the NHL when it came back in the fall of 2005. And I mean, the, the appetite was pent up, right? The enthusiasm was massive. So I kept, I kept thinking of that when the CFL was away saying, okay, what's more likely to happen here? Out of sight, out of mind or absence makes the heart grow fonder. And it actually turned out to be absence makes the heart grow fonder. I mean, even I think if the CFL had missed a second year, I, I don't necessarily believe that. I don't believe there's a cutoff point. Well, you just can't come back. I mean, you know, in Ottawa, the team was gone for what, eight, nine years, right? Like, like that. from 2005 to, to 2013 or 2014. And, and I was living in Ottawa through some of those years. Nobody was watching CFL. I mean, it was off the map, right? And yet when it came back, boom, they had crowds like they never had, you know, in, in decades. So um, I think sometimes the evidence suggests that when a sport is not playing, I mean, I always think that's part of the success of the National Football League. They have seven months where they don't play. Why is everybody so like geeked up for NFL football in September? Because they haven't played in seven months, right? That, yeah, exactly. I think their off season is actually one of their advantages. And like, I'm not a soccer fan, but if I was, I mean, I remember TFC when they won the championship, there were 47 days between their championship game and the start of their training camp, 47 days. Like, <laughs> like I, I, you know, I don't know. It's, I'm not a soccer guy, so I won't comment, but, um, but I think that's, I think sometimes, you know, playing less sometimes, it doesn't necessarily, uh, even if you go off the map for a year or two, doesn't necessarily damage your appeal. And that was something I, I argued, you know, vociferously last fall. And I think it's come to be true. Getting into your story a bit here, who was there really someone that influenced you to get into sports journalism? <laughs> well, it's kind of a funny one on that one, because my, my, I mean, I grew up following, you know, a lot of people in the media. Um, you know, I, I read sports illustrated cover to cover, you know, from the time I was about grade six on, uh, had my favorite writers that I followed with that magazine when it was really, really prominent and top notch. Um, you know, I, I read, you know, I read columnists, my family subscribed to the Toronto star. So I read people like, you know, Dave Perkins and Jim Proudfoot and Milt Dunnell of, of that era. But really my biggest media, uh, influence was, uh, Bob McCowan, you know, um, Bob McCowan had a show in the late seventies called talking of sports on Toronto. It was 10 to midnight on 1430 CKFH 870-9115. If you have a comment, an opinion, a suggestion, then call the talking of sports line now. And I mean, do the math. Bob was, you know, a young man. He was, uh, I I think he must've been in his twenties. And I used to listen to Bob McCowan every night. I talked to my best friend at school the next day about Bob McCowan. Uh, I would phone in on his show. I have a tape of me on his show when I'm 12. Um, <laughs> still have it. Um, and, um, and Bob McCowan kind of was my, you know, my, my media idol, I guess, which was, which was really strange because, um, you know, I ended up being on his show as a guest a few times. And in 2006, Random House called me and said, could you write a book in Bob McCowan's voice? And I said, mm-hmm. I think I could, cause I've been listening to him like since I was 10 um, and I probably could. So I, you know, I wrote a book um, with Bob. I mean, I wrote it, Bob contributed, but I had to write to his voice. And that was the 100 greatest hockey arguments published in 2007, which was the best selling hockey book in Canada that year. Well, uh, but, it was, but it was kind of odd that, you know, I wrote a book 
you know, with a guy that I had, you know, and then of course I took uh, about four years after that, uh, five years after that, I took the afternoon drive uh, job at TSN 1050. And so from four to seven every day, I was going up against Bob McCow, uh, which was pretty weird when you think of that. He was my idol when I was 10. Um, and in fact, when I got that job, when I accepted that job, I sent like a email or a note via Facebook to the guy who was my best friend in like grade six and seven, who, when we always used to talk about Bob McCowan in the schoolyard at Baythorn public school in Thornhill. And I sent him a one line note. I just said, you're not going to believe what I'm going to do. And oh, well, there <laughs> <I> said, you go. <laughs> I am going to host suspense. Show four to seven every day up against Bob McCowan, which is unbelievable because we were kids in grade six so right? you just yeah. listen to them and so sometimes your life takes really and you know my parents could kind of appreciate the weirdness of that right because they remember me as you know this obsessed bob kid you know with bob mccowan and then all of a sudden like i was i would say you know to my mom i say isn't this weird mom like can you believe this and so it was great you know i went up against bob for three years i lost like everybody else does um you know or had up to that point in time um there were, I actually did pretty well against him for a while. And then in 2015, the Blue Jays took flight. And that was a, that was a tough double whammy to be going up against was Bob McCowan and a successful Blue Jays team. Um, so, you know, they brought in the overdrive show, which is a great show. I think it's probably, uh, you know, a better show in that time slot than mine was. Um, and, and, you know, I moved to mornings with Michael Landsberg for a year and a half and I didn't love mornings. I loved Michael, but I didn't love mornings. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was happy um, every once in a while when I get a really horrible night's sleep, I remember what that felt like, you know, and I go yeah. through it all of a sudden at like two in the afternoon, I say to myself, oh my God, this is what doing light, right, morning radio set felt like. So I thought that was probably taking years off my life and I was happy to go back to TV, but, um, but yeah, I guess a long way of answering it. I was, yeah, I was a Bob McCowan guy. I could, I can still quote things that he said in the seventies and eight and early eighties from that. I used to memorize as a kid, you know, and, and it's just weird how I, I ended up actually, you know, going up against him head to head for, for three years. Yeah. I mean, I I'm all for the weirdness about that. I, and it's honestly such a funny story to share, you know, how you went up against your own idol in the same time slot. That is hilarious. As, as uh, yeah, as it, it's, and li listening to the tape, you know, that I could pull out and listen to that. Um, it's uh it, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny but it, i think it just shows you that you know you always hear that about people sometimes athletes in sports that they they grew up watching a guy and then when they get to professional sports that guy's still in the sport right because they idolized him when he was 22 and they were eight and then you know years later they're 22 and he's 36 you know and they're i remember one time when i was a little bit i used to cover baseball a long time ago sitting in a in a dugout with a catcher in his young early twenties, who was about my age for the Red Sox. I can't remember who it was, but I remember chatting with him and we were talking about catching Roger Clemens and Roger Clemens at that time was like maybe early thirties or whatever. And I was saying, I said, like, you and I are the same age, right? So like when you, you were like 15, Roger Clemens was a thing what it's like when somebody has to go from, you know, being your idol to being the guy that you've got to tell him that he's got to throw a slider instead of a fastball at two, two or something. Right. And, and that, that happens in broadcast a little bit, you know, not only people you go up against, but you know, people I've worked with, like, you know, Dave Hodge, for instance. Right. I mean, Dave Hodge is, is enough older than me that when I was a kid, you know, he was a big, big deal to me because he was the host of hockey night in Canada, you know, and Dave and I, worked together for a long time in television and radio. We're still friends. I mean, there are other people like Bob McKenzie who are not that much older than me. So I remember them more as teenagers than I do as, you know, being a, a, a kid. But I think that that part of the whole business is kind of, is, is kind of a neat aspect of it. And it, it just kind of shows that sometimes if you, if you dream of getting to a place, um, you know, some of the people you'll meet will be the people you dreamed about working with when you were a kid. You are a graduate, uh, you know, from Carleton with their journalism yep. program. Uh, you know, what opportunities, if any, did Carleton provide you? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird one. The journalism school, and I, I can't speak to the journalism school today, but I can speak to the journalism school of the late 1980s because I graduated in 1990. Um, journalism school was a good background for me. I don't know that it opened that many doors. I think the thing that really opened doors for me was volunteering 
you know, working on the student newspaper for four years. You know, I, I wrote for two years. I was the sports editor. I was the editor in chief. That was probably far more instrumental to me getting into media than a journalism degree. Uh, you know, I volunteered at the radio station times when I was at Carlton. I did broadcast sports on Skyline Cable 22 in Ottawa for three years. I mean, everything from squash to women's field hockey to Friday night Gloucester Rangers junior hockey. Like I did. And I, again, not getting paid for any of it. Right. So it was that I always say to people who want to do a degree in media, I say, that's great. Go do your journalism degree or journalism at a college or whatever you're doing. But if you really want to get into this business, it is a do business. I mean, you can study it all you want, but it is a do business. You learn by doing in, in media. And so that's, I spent a lot of time doing that. And I always tell the story because it's, it's kind of true. So I, I was in my, my spring of my year that I was graduating, you know, I'd done, I was getting, you know, a, a degree in journalism at the best school in Canada. Um, you know, I, I was the sports editor of the newspaper. I'd written for, for the paper. I'd done radio. I'd done all that. Say it was cable TV. And it was like March of, of 1990. And I was walking across campus and I was like, man, what am I going to do? I got to graduate in like a month. And I have no job offers, like nothing, nothing. I am, I have nothing. And I, and I've never really had a summer job that was media driven. I just, I just volunteered and did free stuff, but I've never been paid as a journalist in my life. Um, other than the student newspaper honorarium I got for being sports editor, which was like 300 bucks a month or something. And I was walking across campus and I went, why, why don't I run for editor in chief of the paper? And I thought, why don't I do that? It was like a Tuesday night. I just, I just hit me. Right. And I went and I asked somebody, I said, do you have to be a student to be the editor in chief? And they checked the constitution and you had to be a student when you got the job. But you oh, didn't have to okay. be a student while you had the job. So I thought, hey, I can come back for a fifth year. The job pays like $13,000 a year, which is $13,000 more than I'm used to making. So I'm just going to live like a student, which is fine, because I'm going to be hanging out with students. And I don't have to take any classes. And I just, by the end of that walk, all of a sudden, I was like, I'm going to do this. And like 48 hours later, I was given a speech to try to get elected as the editor-in-chief of the paper at Carleton. And like... 24 hours after that, I was the editor in chief, like 72 hours after I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything came together so quickly. I was the editor in chief of the paper and, and the guy I beat, and I don't say this gleefully, he was a guy who had designs on being editor in chief of that paper for a long time, like probably a couple of years. <laughs> and I thought for him. him and I, it was tough for him. I actually fell for him. I thought, geez, you know, um, I think he wanted this job more than I did, but, <laughs> but or for a longer time than I did. Yeah, but um, and I got it, and um, and after that, I uh, applied for every internship job I could. The next year, same thing. Didn't get a lot of opportunities, except for one. I got one opportunity, and it was with the Globe and Mail. And a Globe and Mail internship was really great in those days because they didn't baby you; they threw you in. You were, I mean, I was covering, you know, the Argonauts when Rocket Ismail was there. I covered the 1991 All-Star Game. Major League Baseball All-Star Game was in Toronto that year. I wrote, I think, five Jays games. I wrote lead myself. I was 23 years old. Like I said, I'd never been paid as a journalist. And I was writing lead on, I think I think I did three or five Jays games that year. Um, you know, so just pick up the paper the next day and see your name under a headline writing about, you know, a first place Blue Jays team was pretty amazing. I covered the American League Championship Series that year. Um, I had an unbelievable experience and that really changed everything for me because um, it was, it was kind of like pounding at a door, pounding at a door, pounding at a door, doing everything you can to try to break that door down, coming up with this idea to be editor in chief of the paper, putting in another year. And then, you know, my opportunity came, but like most desirable jobs in the world, you need a combination of talent, perseverance, and luck, you know, and, I don't know why I, I had a, I had a lot of perseverance. I had a little bit of talent, a little bit of luck, <laughs> but That's I was, I, just, I think it was just cause you know, that, that vision of what I wanted to do had been born in me so early that by the time I was in my early twenties, I was not going to walk away from it until I felt like I'd done everything possible to try to knock that door down. And I've been lucky. I'm 54 today. I've worked in sports media for, I'm in my 32nd year, you know, um, and I've been blessed and lucky. And if it all ended tomorrow, I would have nothing to say to everybody then. Wow. Thank you. It was awesome. 
you know, I hope I get to do it for about another 10, but we'll see. You did mention that, you know, you worked with the Globe and Mail there with an internship yeah. and, you know, that was kind of like your first big move before coming to mm-hmm. TSN. You also had to stop at CBC. Uh, yeah. You know, how big of a move was that for you to come to TSN? Well, it, it was massive because the credibility that goes with the Globe and Mail, right? And I went from there to CBC Radio and, um, and it worked, you know, I worked at CBC Radio, it was good. The problem is there wasn't much of a future at CBC Radio. They were kind of wrapping up shop about the time I got there. So I worked with them from like 1992 to 1995. And then I freelanced, you know, for about five years from 96 to 2000. A lot of my freelance work was for the Globe and Mail. And because I'd had an association with them before, it was easy to go back there. They knew, you know, they knew, and I was, I was living in Ottawa at that time. I knew the Globe didn't have somebody in Ottawa. So I strategically went there, you know, as a place that I could do things and, and, and eventually I got hired back to the Globe in 2001. And I, I remember there were a lot of the same guys on the desk that were there when I'd been an intern. And I said, I said, yeah, guys, nine and a half years after my internship, I got hired at the Globe. <laughs> I could have gone and become a brain surgeon that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, but that's when I say about perseverance, that's what it takes, right? Yep. Like I lived four years without a job, like without a job. And it turned out to be the greatest gift I ever had professionally because as a freelance journalist, if you can't come up with ideas and be efficient, you can't stay in that business. I mean, it is every day is what am I going to pitch? What's my idea? How, you know, how can I turn this around? And I did, I did it working in television, writing long form, writing news, doing radio uh, and writing freelance for Globe and Mail. I I wrote a junior, junior hockey column for them. So it was freelancing is really, really hard, but it is the greatest education and training you get. Because, you know, it's like every day is a performance review. So what happened was when I finally got hired back to the Globe full time in 2000, then I started getting invited to be on TSN because it was Dave Naylor, Globe and Mail, right? The credibility was right on the screen. And they didn't really know as much about my background at CBC Radio. So when they brought me on, they were like, wow, you can do broadcast. This is pretty cool. Like, we don't, not every newspaper guy we bring on is this natural and broadcast. And I said, well, you know, in between my gigs at the, at the, C, at the Globe and Mail between 1991 and, you know, starting again in 96, I was mostly in broadcast for five years. And they were like, oh, great. And so I just started doing more and more with them. So it, it was a huge thing for me because the, the credibility of the Globe and Mail and my background in broadcast really allowed me to adapt to that. And, uh, you know, TSN tried to hire me in 2005. I said, no. Uh, I, I like working with you guys, but I'm a newspaper guy. Uh, 2010, they came back to me and said, we want, you want to talk about this again? And I said, I will jump into your waiting arm. <laughs> uh, and two things really changed for me in those five years. One was um, the newspaper business got a lot tougher, you know, a lot tighter, a lot. You could see it was a shrinking business and I, and you concerned for its future. And I just learned more about TSN. I mean, when I, when I got hired, uh, got, I got offered to hire there originally in 2005, I didn't know it as well. By 2010, I knew it. I knew the people. I knew the place. I, I, you know, I would say if I was to be honest, and I will be, uh, I was a bit of a newspaper snob when it came looking at TV guys sometimes, Uh, you know, and it, it goes back to the days where it's not like this anymore, but it used to be in television sports. Um, if you were a newspaper guy, you did your story, you broke a story, you wrote something. And then the next day you would watch the TV guy go and read your story and then go do a TV version. Right. And we always felt like TV guys were always a day late just chasing our story. So we always kind of had this snobby attitude about TV guys, but TV started to change, right? They started saying, well, instead of chasing Bob McKenzie's stories, why don't we just hire Bob McKenzie? And that's what they did. You know, instead of chasing Dave Naylor's story from the Globe and Mail yesterday, why don't we just hire Dave Naylor and have him break stories for us? So, so the mentality in television, at least the network level really changed and they wanted to be up front. And they, and that's why, you know, so many of the people they ended up hiring, you, you know, even at the Globe, at the TSN now, you look at people like myself, like Bob McKenzie, uh, Mark Masters, Matthew Shinetti, they're all converted newspaper guys, right? And the same thing in the US, you can see that trend happen as well. So uh, I, had, I had to get over my snobbery about uh, newspapers being superior intellectually and, you know, news wise to TV. Uh, and I've learned to love T- TV and love TSN. I mean, it's the greatest, professionally, the greatest move I ever made. Um, and I'm not just saying that because they pay me and I represent them. I, I always jokingly say I am TSN's happiest employee. I get out of the parking lot every day at Channel 9 Court when I used to go to work. I don't go to, I work from home now, but 
I, I go to Channel Nine Court every day. I get out of the car and I kiss the pavement before I go in. I, I, I'm really, I am deeply, deeply, deeply grateful to the way TSN allows me to do my job and the and the journalism that they stand up for. And and I understand, you know, it's, you know, I play a journalistic role in a sports entertainment business. You know, I'm, I'm not a pure journalist, maybe like you know some people are, where they where it's all about you know, uh, just kind of, you know the importance for social fabric. My journalism is more storytelling. It's not, you know, I'm not changing the world with what I do. Um, it's mostly from the sport entertainment business, which we could all live without if we had to. But I, I appreciate having a, you know, a storytelling role, whether that's something that's happening today or whether I get to write about 5,000 word story. I, I, I love to tell stories. I love when sports intersects with life. And I love especially to tell those stories. And TSN, you know, gives me a great opportunity to do this. And how come you wanted to specialize in the CFL? Well, it's a, it's a weird thing, actually. Um, and every once in a while, people meet me once in a while and say, like people who meet me, I mean, from high school, people I see, like, I haven't seen in 20, 30 years, right? And they'll say, man, like, well, you're a football guy on TV. What, you, you, were, you were a baseball guy. And I was a baseball guy. Like, I was a nutter. Like, baseball to me was the world. In fact, I just moved in May and I found baseball, like, columns that I hand wrote with a pen during the eighties, you know, on the Jays. I used to go to games like in, on, I remember going in Cleveland where there's no fans and like sitting in the right field bleachers with a tape recorder and broadcasting the game into a tape. I was a baseball guy. All I wanted to do was baseball, um, which was weird because my first opportunity with the Globe and Mail was primarily around baseball in 1991. And a couple of things changed in that. One is you realize that baseball is a hard sport on your life. They play every day. Yep. And spring training starts on March, on February 23rd and the World Series is like October 31st or whatever. It's a long, long season and it's every single day. And that's one of the reasons I started looking at it as, a, a you know, your summer is completely gone, like doing baseball every day. So I looked at it. And one of the things I'm like, I said, I don't think baseball is the most life friendly sport to cover. I think I could have a great time covering, but I'm not sure how much else of life I'd get to really experience and live. So that was one reason I kind of went away from baseball. And. And, you know, in the CFL, I'd always had an affinity for it, right? I'm 54, so I'm kind of the last generation of people that grew up in Southern Ontario when it was like a real thing. And I mean, real thing. I mean, it was on, it was part of the mainstream conversation. It's a real thing, obviously. But the Argonauts, you know, especially are not part of the mainstream conversation in Toronto. You know, the Ticats still are in Hamilton, you know, in Ottawa. There's, but in Toronto, I grew up in Thornhill. The Argonauts were, you know, right up there with everything else. And, and I, you know, when the Argonauts won the Great Cup in 1983, you know, I was 16. So, you know, at that rate in that sweet spot where that was a big deal, the parade in Toronto, I remember it. And I always felt like the, the Canadian Football League just had certain values that I identified with. You know, I, I appreciated the Canadians in the game. I appreciated the fact that there were great college players that didn't get a chance to the NFL. I was actually more attracted to the CFL by that than I was the Canadians. I like guys that I watched in NCAA football last fall that didn't go to the NFL, but I could follow them in the Canadian football league. And I've always thought we should promote that aspect of it. You know, we, we sometimes trip over ourselves to tell the stories about Canadians, but you know, there's a lot of really good guys that come out of us college that don't play in the NFL. So that was kind of my interest. And then I guess the other thing was, you know, it was, it was always like a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a task for the CFL to, to survive you know, uh, through once we got into the 90s. And, and I probably got as intrigued by the story of the league trying to reinvent itself or move itself to, serve, to stay relevant as I was by the football. There was sort of two stories I was telling, you know, how does the Canadian Football League reinvent itself to be relevant, you know, for the present and future, and then covering the football at the same time. So I could, I was almost, throughout the league's history, there's always been that sort of other story that's been, you know, since it's been evolving. Um, and I just found the people in the league were great. Um, I love I love the players. Again, not everybody's in it for the money. I don't begrudge guys that are in it for the money, but in the CFL, it's generally more love of the, just the game than it is money. And, you know, I, I think the other thing is that the barriers to getting access to people in other sports a lot of times now are tough, right? Because the media relations and and, you know, everything is so, you know, you're not going to call Bill Belichick up at his office, right? Um, and yet, you know, I could call Wally Buono and he answers his phone, you know, I can text GMs I can, and I know other guys in other sports can do this, but the barriers to getting to people in the CFL are a lot lower. And it's, it's frustrating to cover a sport where you just can't get a hold of people that you want. Yeah, sometimes. it is. I don't think that's, that's a hard, in other sports that takes a long time. And I've been around the CFL a long time, 
So I, I just I just found I loved the game. You know, I loved kind of what it represented to our country. I loved the people in the game. And I found I was able to have a life doing it as well, you know, because CFL plays a long season from June to November, but they play, you know, four games a week, you know, and I don't, I'm not really as much, a, my job is not so much covering games. It's more keeping people interested between the games. Like my job happens from Sunday to Thursday and then the games happen and I'm on the broadcast sometime, but that's not my primary thing. Mine is writing for our website, right? Writing on Twitter, writing, being on sports center, you know, doing features. That's my job is almost, you know, keep ways to create content to keep people engaged and following the Canadian football league, not so much, you know, on the game broadcasts themselves. And, and that kind of fit my niche as well, because I'm a storyteller. So I, you know, I, I learned, I know a lot about football, you know, I understand, you know, um, through osmosis, not so much the X's and O's of the game, but the culture of the game, where the players come from, who ends up in the CFL and why, who, who can get back to the National Football League, you know, uh, the paths for Canadian players, whether it's in Canada or in college. So I've, I've become very knowledgeable about the sport of football, not so much the X's and O's, but the business and, and the culture of football in North America, which, you know, it's, it's the number one sport in North America. You know, it, it, it's not even close, you know, and the NFL is number one in the U.S. College football is number two. Uh, in Canada, you know, the CFL is, is behind uh, is, is behind the National Hockey League, uh, obviously. But, you know, you look at our television rate. I always shock people in Toronto when they don't understand kind of how big the league is in the country. You know, I, and people are like, well, I, I said, well, CFL games, you know, like they'll draw Raptors like on regular season games. And they'll be like, what? Yeah. You know, like it's like a regular season Raptors game doesn't do more than the CFL. I, and I always tell the story. I swear to God, this is true because this is like my line that I'll give to shock people is that about five years ago, the Raptors were in a first round playoff series against the Indiana Pacers. Might have been a second round playoff series. Can't remember. It was an early first or second round against that. It's a pretty big deal. NBA playoffs, Raptors and Pacers. The same week that we aired like game four of the Raptors Pacers series, we aired a Saskatchewan Rough Rider preseason game. Do you want to guess which one did a bigger number? Well, I mean, judging by the way you're going with this, it's going to be the Saskatchewan one. If I tell, if I told everybody in Toronto, a Saskatchewan Rough Rider preseason game outdrew a Raptor playoff game, both with a national broadcast, people would tell me that's not true, that that can't be true, but that is true. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> quite shocking. You know, it honestly does the CFL, you know, some justice. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, we did the, the, the Banjo Bowl this year, or, it was, or maybe it was a Labor Day game, Saskatchewan and Winnipeg on that, on the Saturday, we did 980. Like there aren't that many sports in Canada that do an audience like that. 980,000, right? That's a, for a regular season game, that's a big, big number. I mean, you know, Saturday nights and leaps and halves and stuff here, but, but you're talking about like the elite tier of sports. Oh, in yeah. Canada. So, so I, you know, the league really outpunches its weight on television. You know, that's, that's why the Canadian football league still exists is because it's been a very efficient television property, you know, and continues to be so. Well, you're very successful in the CFL. You know, in 2015, you got inducted into the media side of the Canadian Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, what could I just get a quick comment on that? Like, how did you celebrate? What did that, uh, you know, mean for you? You know, it, it was, um, I, I think it was just like a recognition that I'd been around for a while and done a decent job. You know, that's all I took it was, is that, you know, when you get an honor like that, they, I, I've been covering the league since 1991. You know, I covered my first Grey Cup as a, as a student in, in 1988. And, and you, you, as your career goes on, you never feel like that veteran guy. And then all of a sudden, I remember actually when TSN hired me in 2010, they put out a news release. You know, I'd worked there since 2003, you know, on a freelance basis, you know, and part time. But when they actually hired me and it said TSN hires veteran journalist Dave Naylor, I looked at it and went, well, I guess I am a veteran journalist. You know? <laughs> I, guess, I guess I am, you know, and I guess they're paying me like a veteran journalist. So I better accept that, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, um, and that's kind of what the Hall of Fame thing was like, right? You, you know, you kind of stop and you go, wow, I guess, because I watched a lot of other guys before me get inducted into that hall. And they all seemed like, well, they've been around forever and they could tell stories. And, you know, in 2015, I, I'd been in the league, around the league 25 years, you know, so that it just kind of, to me, was just a recognition that, that I've been around a long time. And, and in this business, if you don't do a good job, you're not around a long time. So it, you know, it, it, it was, it was something I felt very proud of just because, um, you know, my plaque is going to be there for as long as there's a Canadian football hall of fame. And my dad is in two halls of fame. Oh, wow. So, so I got into one. So he's, he's in, uh, he's in the Canadian lacrosse hall of fame. He was inducted in 1980 as a builder uh, he was a pretty good player as well, and um, he was inducted in the Brampton, Ontario Sports Hall of Fame in 2013. 
which was, uh, I think, very special from him. He, you know, he grew up in Brampton, um, played on three straight national championship teams in 57, 58, 59. Uh, and it was really fun. It was a real fun uh, uh, ceremony. You know, uh, former NHL goaltender Jamie Storr was part of his class, you know, um, which was kind of cool as well because I knew who he was, you know. And, and, and uh, so my dad is in two halls of fame. I'm in one. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed. Both my parents were competitive athletes. Um, so that's kind of where I got my love of sports and my interest in sports at a very young age. I didn't get their genetics athletically, unfortunately, neither did my sister, neither, <laughs> neither of us accomplished anything in sports, <laughs> but my parents were both very successful athletes. Well, the last two years for the CFL has been crazy to say the least, really, but for you, it could be even crazier being an insider. How have mm -hmm. you liked or disliked the CFL's road to recovery through this pandemic? I mean, I found it frustrating sometimes just because I think the league hasn't been able to share everything that they want to share. I mean, I think when you're dealing with government and you're dealing with business and you're dealing with different scenarios and, that are going to affect sponsors or television networks, or pop, it makes it, the nature of it is that you have to keep everything in house because you really don't know what's going to happen. And I think sometimes there was a sense with the league that the fans and maybe some of the media got frustrated that the league had answers to things that they were not sharing, you know, that they wouldn't tell us this. Why won't you tell us more? And you know, I mean, sometimes I would hear from people in the league a little frustrated. Really? You want to know what we're doing? What are you doing next summer? You know, like, <laughs> like nobody knows. Right? Like, I think that I think it was frustrating for the league to take a lot of criticism for them not sharing more when they really didn't know what was going to happen. All they knew was various scenarios and, and there were different triggers that could make those things happen. And, 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 you know, again, like even the government part of it last year, I found very frustrating, not frustrating. I found challenging because I mean, there would be a meeting and I didn't know how meaningful the meeting was, or they were talking to this person, how much it, I, I said to somebody at one point, covering this like CFL going, trying to play in the pandemic meeting with government. It's like, if I was covering a CFL season and I had no schedule and I, or no standings, you know, I went to a game and it's Edmonton playing Calgary, but I don't know what the standings are. And I don't have, I don't know whether this is the 10th game of the schedule or the 15th. That's kind of what covering the government CFL stuff was like, where there were all these kind of events or conversations that were happening, but you really didn't know whether this was the fifth conversation they'd had with these people or the fifth department they'd met with or what the deadline was. And it was, I, I thought that was, that was stressful for, uh, I think everybody in the league, I think it was, it was frustrating for fans and, and us in the media. I mean, I even people on Twitter sometimes suggesting that, you know, we were in cahoots with trying to cover up what was really going on and stuff like this. And I was just like, look, I, you know, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> we're just reporting. We're, we're just sending out information that we received. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, even, even with the whole XFL thing in the spring, right? Like I, I was never championing the XFL cause, but I thought they should go down the road and see what it is. Like, I, you know, should the CFL have merged with the XFL and done a deal? I don't know, but I can't tell you that until I know what that deal is. And what it involves right and given the state of the cfl i was very bullish on them like play that out go down that road see where that goes and you know people think wow maple leaf sports entertainment is trying to tell you what to say is telling you what to say on this like i never had a conversation with anybody at maple leaf sports entertainment about this right i just did it um you know they were very bullish on it we knew that from you know the reporting we did i was very bullish not on them necessarily doing it but on them exploring it. and you know that got a lot of blowback and criticism but i i you know i'm pretty comfortable knowing that the, you know any of the conspiracy theories about you know the league or maple leaf sports entertainment telling me what to say uh you know was never a part of it i um you know people could disagree with my opinions on on things that was fine um you know i'm i'm happy the league is playing i i hope this is sustainable i, I have some concerns about you know, what the actual economics are of playing this season and how that might add up after the season. But, uh, but, you know, whether you agree with me or not, my, my heart and mind is always, you know, in, in what's, what's in the best interest of the Canadian football league or professional football in Canada for the long term. Where were you when you heard that the four major sport leagues were going to be shutting down? You know what? I was in Mexico uh, on vacation uh, on that March the um, 13th. 13th yeah. yeah yeah that was the friday um, yeah it was well it was it was actually it was the wednesday night when the nba shut yeah yeah it was um and um it was the wednesday night that the nba shut down hockey i think played that night and then yeah i did and i was slated to go home to mexico the next day and i remember like being there thinking 
you know, obviously I'm in vacation in Mexico, coronavirus is in the news. So I'm a little bit kind of like, is it, how bad is this going to get? Like, should I be nervous or be going home? And it was kind of like there, right? Yeah. It well, was. I was sitting there. I remember looking at my phone. I'm eating like tacos in a restaurant. I'm looking at my phone. <laughs> NBA cancel, suspend schedule. And I'm like, okay, this just stopped being fun. You yeah. know what I mean? And is, and I remember looking, I was with my parents and my son. And I looked at them and I said, the NBA just shut, just put suspended the season. Right. And that was the night that I think the U.S. stopped all flights from Europe. And oh, yeah. so I went home on and I'd been talking to our guys back, you know, in the office when I was in Mexico. They're like, yeah, it looks like we're not going to fly Farhan Lalji in for the combine. It's just going to be you, you know, like in Toronto and that. And I was like, every, every day I talked to them, it was like something else wasn't happening. And I'd gone, I'd gone to a meeting on March the 5th at TSM, the last meeting I had at TSM, and presented a whole bunch of stuff that we were going to do in April in Oklahoma. We were going to do some stuff on Chuba Hubbard. We were going to do some oh, stuff yeah. in Alamore. And, you know, every once in a while I go to the sort of big weekly media and present what I'm doing, you know, so that everyone has a sense. Um, obviously that did not happen. And, um, and yeah, that's where I was. And I flew home the next day and I thought it's probably a good time to be going home. And you know, from that point on, uh, yeah, everything, everything got different. What did you hear from the player side of the whole discussions that were ongoing between the league, the government, and I guess, um, you know, the players during that cancellation of the 2020 season? Well, what I heard from the players was, excuse me one second. I, yeah, um, um, the, um, what I heard from the players was, was just frustration that they didn't know more about what was going on. Right. Um, and that they felt like in the dark and there was a real kind of cold war that developed early on between the players and the league because the players association had said, well, if you're suspending the season, then our players should uh, should have free agency. It got any guys that want to go to the NFL should be allowed to step out of the contracts and do whatever they want. Now, that's a very small number of players, especially after you've already gone through an offseason where certain players were eligible to do that. Um, the only ones who weren't. I mean, I think there were like a very small number of players that did that. But the league saw that as being opportunism, right? Like, well, wait a minute, we're in a crisis here. And you guys are saying, well, hey, there's an opportunity for us. We can get out of our contracts, go to the NFL. Like, wait a minute. Like, we, we all we need everybody focused on, on making this league survive, not saying, you know. So the league got very upset about that. They wouldn't talk to the Players Association for a while. And I think that, again, contributed to the sense that they weren't really partners. I mean, and really, they're not partners, right? I mean, you, the league, every league say that, and you are to a degree, but but when you're looking at a situation where you're going to try and play in a pandemic, well, if this loses gazillions of dollars, the players aren't sharing in that cost. The owners are, right? And I think that's probably ultimately why the owners didn't treat the players like partners in that thing, because it's like, hey, if this if this thing goes sideways or is cost, if this ends up as a big puddle of red ink, if we were truly partners, the players would be helping us in this. They're, they're not right They're We're paying for this. So I think they treated them more like uh, their bosses than they treated them like partners. And that was just maybe the nature of the crisis. And I just think the players were feeling very, very, uh, I mean, the, the, the uncertainty I think was, was the real killer there. And I don't know how much more certainty the, the league could have given. Ultimately, I think the two sides came together and there was more transparency, at least at the, at the, the level of their, their leadership executive. I don't know whether the foot soldiers in the CFL felt any more tapped into, but certainly the players association, the league did a better job communicating and, and ultimately it got better. But I, but I heard a lot of frustration from players feeling like they were very disposable and just not, you know, left at loose ends. There was, and you know, deadlines would come and go and guys would reach out to me and ask me questions about what was going on. I would give them my best opinion, but I, you know, ultimately everything I knew I was pretty much reporting. Well, given that you have these relationships with the players and owners and executives, being an insider, how do you deal with, uh, you know, breaking news and trying to keep players relationships intact? Well, I think hopefully everybody understands you have a job to do, you know, that, that if you break a story that they would rather you not break, if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And maybe they should want it in your hands because, you know, you, you're a responsible, experienced journalist and, and you can you know, do, do the story, you know, you know in a way that, that, that it should be done in the context and everything. Um, the big thing I find sometimes is just sometimes people don't like surprises, you know, like, so I, a lot of times when I'm breaking a story that somebody is going to be affected by negatively or something they don't want out there is I'll just drop them a text and say, just FYI, we're reporting this, you know, in an hour or in 30 minutes or in 15 minutes. And sometimes that's just that acknowledgement. People then understand you have to do your job. They're not mad at you for doing your job. They appreciate the notion that you gave them a heads up so they're not blindsided by something. Yeah. 
And, and that's kind of the way you do it. Cause you're, you never want to come across as being, you know, the agent for the players association or the agent for the owners or the agent for the league office or any of that. Right. And obviously we have different relationships we have to manage. Um, you're trying to be fair to everybody and be transparent as you can with everybody, you know? So that's, that's kind of the way I try, try and do it. It's, it's just, you know, understand that sometimes people are not going to like what you report. There are certainly stories we've reported. I'm trying to think which one it was. Oh, I know one. Uh, when it came out, oops, excuse me, the dog is calling me here. No um, worries. When the, uh, there was one where the players were, the, the league was going to ask the players to take a haircut for any game that was played with no fans. Remember that one? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I do. It was, yeah, we broke that one. And I remember talking to some of the players association the next day and they were, they were upset that that story had come out and they said, you just made our job a lot harder. Like, cause all our guys, like, is the, you know, the players felt like we missed a season. We've already taken a pay cut. We don't yeah. have for playing this year. And then I break a story that says they may be asked to take an extra 20% off for any games of fans. And yeah. of course the reaction from the players is like, screw that. Right. Like they're, yeah. and then they're mad at their executive because what are you guys talking about this for? No way. And I had some people at the top of the executive say to me, like, that, that, that story did not do us any favors. And I said, but guys, like, it's true, right? And, like, that's what the league brought up. And um, if I don't do it, somebody else is doing it. And, you know, by the end of a conversation, they may start with you very angrily. <laughs> but by the end of it, they generally come around, right? Because they, they understand everybody's got a job to do. Sometimes your job doesn't dovetail with their interests in terms of information that gets out there. But if you, if you give them a heads up, and we, on that one, I, I believe we definitely gave them a heads up. I remember we gave them a heads up and said, hey, we're going to report this um, just so that they had some time to, you know, not again, people don't like being blindsided. You know? Yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, you do that measure of respect and you follow it up with phone calls the next day and you, and you try to keep the relationship going. You know? And if you get anything wrong, then you're accountable. That's the other part of it, you know, yeah. and, and I have got stuff wrong. Um, uh, you know, we, that, that happens to the best journalists in the world. And when that adversely affects people, you know, you take that seriously. Amid all the, you know, excitement to return back to playing, uh, I think the news of the expansion Atlantic team kind of got lost, maybe because it was the pandemic and, you know, just getting back on the field. Um, you know, is the CFL still looking into expanding into, you know, a franchise over there? I think it's kind of like back burner territory. There's so many things that have to stabilize in the league first. I mean, I, we got to prove that this league is economically viable in the current circumstances. And, and I think, you know, there's going to be some accounting done at the end of this year that may show uh, some cracks in that. Right. Um, I, I think you want to make sure every owner that you have in this league is still committed fully into what is still an uncertain future. And I think once you get to those kind of things, um, you know, then you can kind of revisit where you are. I think ultimately, it, it, you know, it's not a priority in Atlantic Canada right now. Uh, it kind of hit the pause button. There was a lot of legwork that went into it. Can you pick that up? But I, I don't see that as something that's going to be active, you know, for at least the next couple of years. I, I just think there's so many questions around the league and its stability um, right now that, and I don't know what the priorities, how the priorities may have shifted for regional government in Halifax as well, or the provincial government, right? Um, you know, they haven't been the worst area hit in COVID, but do they have other, or, or maybe they want an infrastructure project where they want to see people put to work, you know, um, in a stadium. I, I just think there's, it's so many unknowns. Business deals don't thrive in, un, in uncertain environments. And this is a very uncertain environment for the CFL. So I think this is something that's going to have to wait till things stabilize. Well, with given all the issues that the CFL has had, you know, uh, with the pandemic, that's obviously causing economic yeah. issues. But, you know, like all, all the other leagues uh, throughout their years and their seasons, yeah. they've dealt with COVID issues. This year, we've seen that the CFL has a COVID issue with the Edmonton Elks. Can I just get your thoughts on that whole situation? Well, I, I think, you know, the CFL was hoping to get through for a year without that. Um, and, I, and I think maybe there may have been some sense that, you know, when you've got uh, you've got players that are vaccinated to the degree that they are, that, that, you know, you're past it, but you know, we learned that that's not the case, right? I mean, there were a lot of the guys that were, there was some of them were guys that had had full vaccination. Um, and of course, then we had the incident with the one player who, you know, had lied to his team about being vaccinated. And it's a little unclear kind of about what role he may have played in, in the outbreak, but um, you know, that, that they, you know, they, they came down very hard on him. I mean, he was released and then the league banned him, banned yeah. any team from signing the rest of the year because, 
he was a good enough player that if they'd been forced to release him without that, he would have been just playing for somebody else. So it's like a double punishment for the team. Um, so I, I thought it was, you know, not totally shocking. I know people in the league were very worried about that they were going to have an outbreak at some time. And, and I can't speak to what the specifics of what went, went on there, but it just seemed like it, since it affected it, you know, such a big number, you know, I think it was ultimately 14 guys. Yeah, I think so um, as you know, well. Yeah. So that's a big number and you had a game canceled and, and guys would have lost paychecks. I, I, you know, that potentially, we, we don't know for sure of the vaccination rates on Toronto and Edmonton, but uh, if they weren't at 85, that means nobody gets paid. So now they're going to, you know, s- squeeze this game in on November 16th. The Elks are going to have to play three games in seven or eight days, you know, and, but the player, they ultimately put it, in the, put it in the player's hands and the players voted to do it. Right. So, um, you know, that's, that's part of, um, that's part of why, uh, that's part of how that, how that all went down. But I, I don't think it should be especially shocking. I mean, it was a bigger outbreak than I would have expected. Um, and again, without speaking to the specifics, all we know for sure is that one of those players in that environment told the team he was vaccinated and was walking around under the conditions of somebody who was vaccinated when he wasn't. And I so, think that we you know, should... That, oh, sorry. That yep. oh, sorry. I just want to add, like, I think that we should be very thankful that the, you know, uh, spread, it didn't spread to any other teams. It didn't spread to the Argos. It didn't spread to the Lions who were heavily tested as well. Yeah, it, it, it could have been worse, you know, and the Argonauts had a positive test, I'm going to say, a week after that. Yeah. And I remember finding that out, and they they tested everybody the next day, and, you know, and, and, and they had some guys sit out, you know, a little bit for, for contact tracing, but it, it never spilled into that. And that's really, you know, that's the one thing. It doesn't seem like even in the other incidents, if anybody's ever got COVID or maybe have to be very isolated incidents where teams, it's where it's spread from one team from another from playing football. You know, as, much, yeah. as close a contact game as this is, that doesn't seem to be something, you know, I, I think we just know the, the how much it more inefficient it is to spread when the game when you're outdoors and football is a game that you're outdoors in and you're you know you, you're not always socially distanced but it at least for that sake it doesn't seem to be something that you know was transmissible during a game and, and i think that was that was a real i mean that motivated some players i mean there were more players that went out and got vaccinated after that uh, i think every team may have taken everything a little more seriously when they saw you know what happened in edmonton we're through four weeks, four or five weeks of the season now. Are there any teams that you're kind of surprised and shocked with? You know, I picked Winnipeg to win the Great Cup. I thought they would repeat, um, and they're the best team in the league. Yeah, 100%. Um, not, I mean, I think Hamilton surprises me a little bit, just that they haven't been better on offense. I mean, mm-hmm. they scored 14 points their first two games. They scored 16 against Toronto. You know, they've had the, they, you know, last week they squeaked one out with, you know, thanks to some turnovers and things. But other than those two games, you know, where Dane Evans started um, and finished, they, they just, Hamilton averaged 30.7 points a game last year. You know, Their just, offense has been that's sputtering this season. Yeah, it really has. I mean, they don't have a great running game. They've had some changes on the offensive line that over the first couple of weeks. They really missed Chris Ben's aisle, you know. Um, they, they've got more new players than I think we appreciate, you know, in terms of receivers, Brandon Banks has been out and, and wasn't really playing at an MOP level even before he went out. So we're a little surprised by Hamilton. Um, not surprised that Toronto has been relatively good. I mean, I, I don't think it's a real shock team for me in, in some ways. I think the league has very much come out the way I expected it would, which for all the uncertainty and variables of new players is kind of amazing. I thought Winnipeg and Saskatchewan, would be, I mean, Calgary is the one that, until last week, Calgary hadn't really played a bad game. I yeah. mean, they, they'd had every game decided in the last three minutes. I, that one shocked me, that one Friday night. I mean, that's the worst game I've seen Bo Levi Mitchell play, in, you know, other than the one maybe with a broken foot through four picks. But, you know, for them to go into Hamilton uh, and not be able to be the guy making his first start, you know, with Bo Levi Mitchell healthy playing, Calgary surprises me. Now, I think the rest of their games, they haven't been terrible. You know, I, I, that was one of the reasons I really thought they would win that game is I thought, well, okay, these guys are two and four, but they're not really two and four. Like they've, they've had some games that, you know, missed field goal against Win. They almost won at Winnipeg, you know, on yeah. a miss on a, they lost on a missed field goal. So Calgary most recently, but overall, I think, you know, I looked for Winnipeg and, and Saskatchewan to be very good in the West, you know, Calgary and Edmonton, BC kind of to fight it out behind them. And that's kind of what's happening in the East. I thought it would be Hamilton. Um, it's kind of, you know, a three-way Montreal, Hamilton, Toronto, and, and Toronto's, you know, like I expected, they're better. You know, I, I can't say I'm shocked by Ottawa. I, I had concerns about Matt Nichols' health, you know, just because that's been the story with him 
the last three, four years, even when he's playing, how nicked is he? How healthy is he really? Is he, you know, and, and I think that's been the issue in, in that his, for whatever reason, he either hasn't fully recovered from the surgery or there was too much throwing in training camp and his arm hasn't been able to stand up to it. And, you know, they turn to a guy in Dominique Davis who makes some plays that excite you and makes some plays that scare you. And that's what we saw in week number one. And you know, we just knew they had so many new players, so many young players that it's maybe not a shock to see where they are. They were more at the beginning of a, of a rebuilding cycle, I think, than Toronto, which, you know, went outside a bunch of veteran guys and tried to rebuild that way. As we are closing off this interview here, do you have any advice for aspiring sports journalists? I get asked that one a lot. And it's, it's a hard one because the world has changed so much since I was breaking in, you know, um, I, I think, you know, traditional means of getting hired are, are sometimes very difficult to come by. Um, you know, I, I, the, the real advice I always say is wherever you want to work, get to that place as fast as you can and do anything. And by that, I mean, like if you're sweeping the floor, or cleaning the toilets there, you know, Maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. At least your name's in there. <laughs> they get familiar yeah. with who you are. Get in the building of the place you want to be. That is really my advice. And do and whether that's an internship while you're in school, which is the best way to do it, because once you're out of school, like at TSM, we have internships. We don't have them for people. I, we get calls from people who want to come and volunteer and do an internship after they're done school. We can't do that legally. That's that's yeah. called not paying people, right? <laughs> so so. You, you have to, it has to be an internship while you're in school. So I would say do an internship, do as many of them as you can and do whatever you can to get in the building of the place. That, I, I've seen it so often that, that somebody starts doing a little something somewhere. And then the next thing they're doing a little more and then they're doing a little more and they're doing a little more. And, you know, when you're there and you're present and you get an opportunity to show what you can do, then people give you more opportunities and, and doors kind of open up. So that's always my advice is that, if you're going to be a production assistant, even if you want to be on air someday, you look at a lot of guys at TSN, you know, like Jay and Dan, who were the, who had the show forever. I mean, they were guys that I think started in the newsroom, not on air, right? But all of a sudden they had the headline show, right? Um, and I don't believe he, Dan may have, but I think Jay started like doing scripts, you know, like for somebody. So it's, you know, like there's lots of people in this business that are doing the frontline jobs that everybody would love to be able to do. And they, at one time they were doing something that might've seemed very menial, but that's, that's how you get it. Get, that's how you do it, you know? And so that's kind of my advice. And, and, you know, if you believe in yourself, don't say, don't, don't take no for an answer, you know, find another way. And, and always try to find like what, what it is that you do, like, what do you do? Well, you know, like everybody, I mean, I kind of turn to the opposite of that. Cause I always joke that I'm not the best at anything, but I can probably do more than almost any journalist in this country in terms of variety. I, you know, I can break news. I can do features. I can host, I can be a guest. I can write columns. I can, I can, you name it, I can do it. And that was a lot of that was because of not having a job for a long time and having to freelance and developing all those skills. So my thing actually became my identity sort of became that I can do anything like you, you, whatever you want me to do, I can editorially deliver that to you, you know, in whatever form, whether you need a breaking news story or a feature or a opinion or a column or whatever. Um, so, so what is it that you, that, that, you know, that you do is whether it's a particular area in a sport that, you know, or the type of stories you like to tell or the, the contacts you've got, that you're going to try and bring, or whether you're an opinion guy, or whether you're going to interview people like on a podcast like this. Right. Uh, and, and just kind of, and just do, 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 do. Like I, I said to you before about being in school, being in school was great. But the thing that makes you noticeable, it makes you better in this business. It is a do business. So, you know, take your shot and do exactly the kind of thing that you're doing right now. Well, I'd like to thank again, Dave Neal, for coming on the podcast. Thank you again, Dave. My pleasure. Uh, hey, it's, uh, it's an honor to be a guest and uh, good luck with everything.